Greetings. Today I will talk about the beginning of the American Revolution in 1775. As more disturbing information about the situation in the American colonies arrived, British Secretary of State William Legg, 2nd Earl of Dartmouth, grew concerned. He dispatched orders to British General Thomas Gage that he was to confiscate military supplies that the Americans had assembled in various locations in Massachusetts and arrest colonial leaders. Gage received these orders on April 14, 1775. The orders general nature gave General Gage a great deal of latitude in the way he accomplished those orders. Someone well placed in the Massachusetts Provincial Congress began sending British General Thomas Gage intelligence letters in 1774. On April the 15th, 1775, Gage received a letter from this spy that the Congress, though still divided on the need for armed resistance to the British, had well developed plans to do so. The Congress had chosen delegates to dispatch to other colonial assemblies to consider forming an 18,000-man army in New England to resist the British. An alarmed Gage relieved some of his British soldiers under his command of their normal duties to prepare for a military strike against the rebels. Gage had decided to strike at the colonial military supplies stockpiled at Lexington, which was about 15 miles northwest of Boston that day. He ordered a 20-man force sent out into the countryside around Boston to patrol and intercept any messengers that might be carrying news of British troop movements to colonial leaders in Lexington and Concord. General Gage assembled his senior officers for a staff meeting around dusk on April the 18th. He informed his staff of his orders and dispatched his commands, which were to prepare the troops for action. After, after adjourning the meeting, one of his officers went out into the streets to gather information from the people in the street that he could glean. He heard comments that the British would not find any military supplies at Concord. He immediately went in to report to Gage. The information surprised Gage, who had been operating using extreme secrecy. He orders his troops to seal off the city to prevent messengers from leaving Boston. Gage had 11 of the 13 regiments awakened and mustered from their barracks around 9 o'clock p.m. on April the 18th. Gage had about 700 men ready for assault. About half of these, 350, were grenadier companies. Grenadiers were physically larger, taller, and stronger than regular soldiers were. The Army considered them as elite assault troops and used them accordingly. The rest of the force consisted of about 320 light infantry troops. Light infantry typically carried lighter equipment than their counterparts and were more mobile. Commanders used them initially, mainly as skirmishers that moved ahead of the main force, engaging the enemy when they, as they attempted to disrupt the foes before the main force arrived. To reach Concord, the troops first had to cross the Charles River and disembark on the road on the other side. They would use naval barges to cross the river. The captains used to command the individual regiments were not the regular officers that commanded the soldiers, so both officers and soldiers were operating with them or they were operating with people they weren't familiar. Loading the soldiers on the barges did not go smoothly. Since the wharf was adjacent to the town commons, a confusion was, a, was apparent to any townspeople that might be about. The commanders packed the soldiers onto the barges. There was little room for movement after they were finally after they finally disembarked. Leaders of the colonial resistance belonged to the Boston Committee of Correspondence and Massachusetts Committee of Safety had heard reports of British plans to move against Lexington. The groups had hired Paul Revere to act as a messenger to carry letters back and forth between colonial leaders in various locations around Boston. One of the leaders contacted Revere on the evening of the 18th and told him that the British troops were on the move and he should ride to Lexington to warn the leaders that they were staying there, that the British were on the march. Since colonial leaders had already taken the precaution of moving the gunpowder, cannon, and ammunition to other locations, he was not worried about the British finding them. The British had two options to get to Lexington, a northern route and a southern route. If the British took the northern route, they would have to cross the Charles River, about half mile wide at that point, land on the North Shore, and take the road to Lexington. The other overland route went south and then west to cross the river over a bridge and continue on to Lexington. Revere wanted to know which route they would take, so he tasked his church sexton at the Old North Church and then called Christ Church to signal him from the tower when he discerned which route the soldiers would take. His instructions 
to the sextons were light one lamp if the troops were taking the land route and two lanterns if the troops were to cross the Charles River. Revere then went to his house to get his boots and coat and proceeded to the North End waterfront to row across the river to get a horse. As he rode, a British warship anchored in the anchor on the other side came into view. Revere managed to land without anyone on the ship discovering him. As he picked up his horse, some members of the Sons of Liberty that met him warned him of the British patrols that were about. Revere borrowed a horse from a local Patriot sympathizer and waited. He did not wait long. As Revere and his contacts talked, the sexton in the church tower lit two lamps and waved them about. After seeing the signal, Revere set out for Charlestown, just outside Boston, and was almost captured by a British patrol. He decided upon a different, longer route through Medford. As he rode, he warned residents that the British regulars were out and on the march to Lexington. Once he arrived in Lexington about half past midnight, he went to the place that Samuel Adams and John Hancock stayed, awakened them, and warned them that British regulars were on the march. Shortly after Revere's arrival, two more men arrived, William Dawes and Dr. Samuel Prescott. After a brief meal, Dawes, Prescott, and Revere decided to go on to Concord and verify that the supplies had already been moved. The men rode off to warn Concord residents that the British were marching their way. Before they got to Concord, a British patrol captured them. Dawes and Prescott managed to escape. However, the British retained Revere. After questioning him for some time, they released him after taking his horse. Revere walked back to Lexington in time to watch the beginning of the American Revolution. The British troops disembarked in the waist-deep waters of the Charles River. As they waited to receive their rations, ammunition, and other supplies, they could hear the sound of church bells sounding in the distance as the colonials rang out the alarm. Sensing that they had lost the element of surprise, the British commander sent a messenger back to General Gage requesting reinforcements. The French and Indian War veteran, Captain John Parker, had gathered about 80 militiamen at Lexington to await the British advance. Parker had gotten Revere's warning and had assembled his troops in the dead of night, and the men awaited in the dark, wondering if Revere's warning had been accurate. About 4.15 a.m., April the 19th, 1775, a scout arrived with the word that the British troops really were on the move and had advanced to a position near Lexington. Parker did not expect the confrontation to end in battle. He positioned his men so they would not impede the British advance and ordered his men not to fire unless the British fired first. The British had executed these types of operations before, and he expected that they would come, search for supplies, and then return to Boston. British troops arrived about 5 a.m. to find a body of militia lined up at the town common armed with muskets, blunderbusses, or any other weapon that they could find. One of the British officers rode along the line ordering the colonials to disperse. Armed with muskets and bayonets, the British would have been an imposing force. The outnumbered colonials did not disperse, and the two forces faced a brief standoff. No one is determined who fired the first shot. Both British and colonials claimed that the other fired it. A bystander, there were about 200 onlookers, could even have fired it. Someone did fire it, however, and that first shot set off a long simmering war. After the shot, the foes exchanged a ragged volley after with the British fixed bayonets and charged the colonials. Eight militiamen, eight militiamen died in the attack. The men quickly scattered and ran. Colonel James Barrett had taken command of the colonial militia forming it in Concord. Reports trickled in about the actions at Lexington. Barrett, with about 250 militiamen under his command, first took up a position along the road to defend the town. Here are reports that indicated the approaching British force numbered around 700. He withdrew to the town. After further consideration, he abandoned Concord and took up a position on a hill overlooking the town. During the time he waited, more militia arrived and the size of his force grew. The resistance had rattled the British troops. After the officers regained discipline, they began their march to Concord. This march also proceeded with little opposition. Upon arrival, they found Concord undefended. The British commander ordered some of his troops to move and secure the bridges into town, and then he began to search for munitions. Loyal supplies had informed the British that the location of the few military supplies remaining in Concord. The soldiers found three cannon, some shot, some barrels of flour, and some other supplies. They burned the cannon carriages and damaged the weapons. The barrels of the flour and shot they had thrown into the mill pond. The colonials managed to recover these supplies after the British left. 
Colonel Barrett's troops occupied a position above the North Bridge that the British were guarding. By now, his force totaled around 400 men, while the British force guarding the bridge totaled only about 90. He decided to attack. He ordered his men not to fire unless fired upon and advanced towards the bridge. The British, seeing the, the appearance of a superior force, began an orderly retreat across the bridge. Some of the soldiers began pulling up planks on the bridge to retard the colonial advance. However, the officer in charge ordered them to stop. The colonials began advancing across the bridge in columns while the militia men on the other side formed into a line. A British soldier fired a shot, followed by another ragged volley. Barrett ordered his men to fire and the battle began. It did not last long as the outnumbered British broke and ran. By now, the colonial force had grown to almost 1,000 men. The British commander, having found few supplies and by now concerned about his troop safety, in light of the growing colonial force, ordered a return to Boston. The march to Lexington and Concord, except for the brief confrontation in, in Lexington, had been largely uneventful. The return to Boston turned into a nightmare for the beleaguered British soldiers. The colonial force continued to grow. Many of these men were experienced fighters, having served in the French and Indian War and as rangers fighting for the Indians. They formed an effective, persistent fighting force that harassed the British all the way to Lexington. Here, they trapped the British briefly until reinforcements from General Gage arrived. Thus reinforced, the hungry, exhausted British continued their retreat. They arrived back in Boston 21 hours after they left, exhausted, hungry, and demoralized. Forty British soldiers died in the day's action, while the Colonials lost 25. Colonial wounded totaled around nine, the British 80. By the end of the day, the British found themselves holed up in Boston, surrounded by a Colonial force that would eventually total 15,000 men from the surrounding area and many other colonies. Next week's episode will relate the appointment of Henry Hamilton as royal governor at Detroit and the Treaty of Pittsburgh, both important events in the history of Indiana, actually. Find out more about Indiana history by purchasing the book, Indiana's Timeless Tales, Prehistory to 1781. The book includes the early history of Indiana from the time glaciers melted until the final days of the Revolutionary War. The book includes sketches of the native tribes that inhabited the state, as well as French outposts established during colonial times. You can find it on my website, www.mossyfeetbooks. There are links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, and other online booksellers. Purchase the book in ebook or softbound versions. An audiobook version is available on Google Play. Residents of southeastern Indiana can find my books at the Walnut Street Variety Store on George Street in Batesville. At the conclusion of this series, I will compile the episodes into an audiobook. The audiobook will be available on Audible, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, as well as many other audiobook sellers. You can also order these books directly from me, the author, on the webpage. If you wish me to sign the book, just send me an email to mossyfeetbooks at gmail.com requesting assigned books and instructions on how you want me to address it. Note, if you send me an email, I will add you to my contact list. Readers on the list will receive an email from me announcing when I publish a new book. If you do not want me to add you to the list, tell me and I will not add you. Listeners of this podcast that want an email notification of my new releases can just send me an email requesting additional